for his grace this morning. Amen. We're happy that you're here worshiping with us this morning. If you would do me a favor and turn around, I want you to make eye contact with like three people. And I just want you to wave at them. I want you to greet each other in the new way today. And I want us to just get our blood flowing. Let's wake up and let's worship the Lord today. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation. We believe. We believe in this broken. All is dark you ever see. There is only one salvation. We believe. We believe. Believe 
far be it from me to not believe And even when my eyes can see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Through it 
Father, we just thank you for your presence here this morning. We just thank you for your presence, Father. ask that you would just have, that you would just move freely in this service, Father, as we just wait in your presence just for one more moment. You guys can be seated this morning. Isn't it so awesome just to come and just be in his presence? I love that. We get to do that. Okay, I got a few announcements for you guys this morning. I guess we're just going to keep chilling. <laughs> I guess we're going to keep playing. Awesome. <laughs> okay, ladies, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Can If you're a lady, can you just wave your hand at me? I just need to tell you guys, y'all are awesome. Uh, tomorrow we have a women's meeting at 7 p.m. It's going to be here at the church. Miss Jerry is out of town right now, so she's not here today. But um, I'm sure she has something really awesome planned for us. She usually does. And um, it is um, a potluck. So, ladies, if you'll just come and fellowship with us, we'd love to. We always have such a fun time. And so we'd love it if you guys would come and and be a part of that with us. Um, also, prime timers. Wave your hand at me, prime timers. One. There's one prime timer here. <laughs> oh, I see Peter, too. Prime timers. Um, on uh, June 8th at noon o'clock here at the church, we're getting our prime timers group started up again. We're get, they're going to be having a potluck. Um, it's just going to be a really fun time for you guys, too. Probably not as fun as this woman have, but maybe. I don't know. You should still come and check it out. And then... Um, in August, we are going to resume our ladies' night. Ladies, if you have never been, they're always so much fun, and it's just an event where um, the men in the church, they will serve us, and usually there's some sort of entertainment. It's not great every year, but it's pretty good. <laughs> it's always a fun time, and it's just a way for the men to honor the ladies in the church, and you can invite people um, and it's always just so much fun, and the entertainment's so much fun. And most of the time, we get to dress up in cool themes. And so we're going to have more info um, about Ladies' Night. But it is going to be in August, so ladies, start blocking off some of your Saturdays. And uh, we would just love for you guys to join us for that as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Donovals. Pastor Donovals, sorry, he was talking to me, and he interrupted my really awesome introduction of him. <laughs> Well, if she was full of the Spirit, it wouldn't have bothered her at all, you know, if she'd had the anointing. So good to have each one of you. Turn to about uh, three people this morning and say, you are awesome, you're beautiful, and you smell good. Now you, uh, now you turn back and you say, I know, I knew that. Amen. <laughs> uh, today, uh, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but today is Pentecost Sunday. And, you know, in, a, in our church, we don't, uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of traditions that we follow. We don't really have any rituals that we, I guess rituals, I mean just things that we do every Sunday uh, to observe in our, in our worship of the Lord. Uh, for us, it's about, it's about relationships. It's about relationships. We, we, have, we have rules. We have two rules. That's all. That's all I can remember is two. Uh, <clears throat> the love God with all your heart, love your neighbors yourself. That's the two rules we have in our church. And Jesus said, if you fulfill those two commandments, that you fulfill all of them. 
just in loving God with all your heart, love your neighbors yourself. Uh, so we observe, obviously, communion and, and water, water baptism and, and such. So those, those are very important to our, our Christian faith. But a lot of the other things that some of the other churches uh, observe, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, because we're, we're, more about, we're more about the relationship that we have. This amazing relationship we can have with God. I feel sorry for people that sit on church seats or pews and they, they come in and, and they go through the motions and, and Paul said to be very careful about having a form of godliness but you deny the power thereof. And I can tell you if the gospel of Jesus Christ is anything, it's the power to change lives. And boy, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm thankful, I'm thankful that the Bible says if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. All those old things pass away. Behold, the new has come. Or we become new in him. And that's the most important message that any person can hear is that you can, you can be born again by the Spirit of God. It's not about just joining a church. It's not just about observing the rituals of a church, but it's about having an encounter with God where your life is changed. That's the greatest message, the greatest miracle that any person can experience is to be born again by the Spirit of God and have your name written in the book of life. Because if faith in Christ and that relationship with God is anything, it is hope. I, we're living in some very dark times. People, I, I encounter and talk to people all the time that are in such dark places, and I'm so thankful this morning that I have a hope that I can share with with them. And that hope is not a thing, but that hope is a person. Anybody here this morning know Jesus? <laughs> Amen. Because it, it, just, just knowing him will absolutely change everything. No, it doesn't change your past, but we find forgiveness from our past. And don't worry about my past. I don't live there anymore. And all those things are under the blood of Jesus. And I'm thankful that as a follower of Jesus, I don't have a past. But man, do I have a future. <laughs> Amen. And so we have something, something to look forward to. So there's a very life-changing experience that we have when we come to Christ, but there's also another life-changing life experience that as a Christian that, that we can experience that really finds its beginning in this day that we're going to talk about, this celebration we're going to talk about, Pentecost Sunday. Now, the word Pentecostal is a very highly charged, controversial word. And uh, a lot of people associate a lot of very strange and weird things with Pentecost. But Pentecost commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus Christ while they were in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks was an Old Testament observance or celebration that coincides with Pentecost. Now, people get really worked up about Pentecost, but you know what the word Pentecost means? It means 50. That's all that the word means. It comes from a Greek word that means 50. In other words, Pentecost happened 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want to read to you the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I, 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 I want you not only to listen with your ears this morning and not only open up your heart, but I want your spirit to be open today to what the Spirit would say to you. The Bible tells us we have this unique relationship with the Holy Spirit that if our, our, if, our spirit, if our spirit bears witness with his spirit, we have that connection, we have, we have that confirmation in our heart, that hope in our heart when that takes place, that we are children of God. And it's my prayer this morning that your spirit will come alive. It, it's, my, it's my desire this morning that you will be reminded of, of this person of the, of the Holy Spirit who is alive and well and active on this planet today. All around us were surrounded by the evidences. You know, I just thought, I thought for the longest we were living in the book of Revelation because it's like every week we had something else happening. But now this week, I think maybe we've gone back to the Old Testament because we're having plagues of Egyptian biblical proportion and these mosquitoes that are attacking us. I got a little nervous when I was heading for the church. I saw people swinging at each other. I thought, I need to change my sermon to love and talk about love this morning. So I thought people were swinging. Then I realized when I got in, they were swinging at mosquitoes because these things, you know, these Texas-sized mosquitoes, which happens to be mosquitoes. I don't know if you knew this. They're the state bird of Louisiana. They're not here, but they're just, 
they could be pets here. But those things can get those things can get really, really large. But but the word Pentecost, it just means 50. That's all the word means. And so 50 days after, after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now, uh, for 10 days, those believers, and, and we know from Acts chapter 1, it was 120 believers. Uh, 11 of the original disciples were there. Judas obviously was not there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, some of those women that were close followers of Jesus. So there was 120 and all. Now, it's interesting because when Jesus left and he ascended, he gave this message, this commandment to 500. 500 stood there and observed Jesus as he ascended into heaven. But he said, he told 500, he said, you go and you tarry in Jerusalem and you wait for the promise of the Father. And you'll know when he gets here. I'm not going to tell you but how you'll know, but you'll know when the Holy Spirit arrives. He told 500, but interestingly enough, only about 120 out of the 500 were there. Now, maybe some of them later came along and had an experience, this experience. But what an amazing event that would have been to have been with that 120 and to experience what we're going to read about this morning when the Holy Spirit came. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues, or some of the other newer versions interpret that, flames of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. So this is a very interesting and such an important part of our Christian faith, this period of time, this 50 days, because we know Jesus died. And we know on the third day he was raised from the dead. And after his resurrection for 40 days, he appeared to his disciples. He shared many things with them. So much of, the, so much of what he shared we're not aware of. It was not recorded in the Bible for us, but we have enough to know pretty much the, uh, the important things that, that, that we needed to understand. So for those 40 days, and the last thing, as I've already mentioned, he told his disciples, you go and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And so for 10 days, those believers, how many uh, at one time were there? I don't know, but when the Holy Spirit came, 120 were there, and they were in that upper room, and then the Holy Spirit came, and there was a sound of a blowing of a violent wind from heaven, and it filled the place they were sitting. I don't know about the God you serve, but the God I serve is a supernatural God, and there's nothing too hard for Him. I think... Uh, Someone, someone has wisely said the sins of the Old Testament were against the Father and the sins of the New Testament were against the Son. The sins of our present day are against the Holy Spirit. Because no, there's no one that has ever existed that has been more misrepresented, more misunderstood. Paul in one, said, Paul in one place said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And yet, I wonder how many times in our lives we grieve this precious Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He's not a thing. He's not a presence. He's just not a force. He is a person. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We seem to know so much about the Father. We know a lot about the Son because of the Gospels that are given to us. But yet, in spite of the fact He's recorded many times in Scripture, we seem to not really understand much about the Holy Spirit and His work that, that is so misrepresented. Now, I, I know a lot of folks, when they hear the word Pentecostal, and if, and if you want to understand, uh, I guess, the point I'm trying to make, go on YouTube uh, and just put in Pentecostal Church, and you will see all sorts of things that are being representing the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. One of the sins against the Holy Spirit is the misrepresentation. And people many times that do things to bring attention to themselves and then try to point and say, well, that's the Holy Spirit that's working in my life. Look, I don't have all the answers and I cannot explain God. And I know that God doesn't, when he wants to move, he doesn't come to me and ask for my permission. And that's just fine with me. 
But I'm just telling you something that when the Holy Spirit begins to move in your life, He brings such peace that passes all understanding. When the Holy Spirit begins to move in your life, He begins to empower you. You see, we're living in the last days, and in these last days, Scripture tells us that there are going to be demonic attacks, there's going to be a spiritual battle that's going to escalate. But just as salvation, there's a change in your life when you have an encounter with God's Holy Spirit and your life is changed and you become empowered to live by the Holy Spirit, you're going to see an energy and a power and a strength and a peace and a love and a joy that's going to flow. Jesus said, he that believes in me out of his inward being shall flow rivers of living water in John chapter 7. And then John goes on to explain this he spake of the Holy Spirit who was not yet given out of our inward being. David had a picture of this in Psalms 23. He said, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And the reason why you don't have the joy in your life and you're not experiencing that peace of God that passes all understanding, you're not able to overcome those secret sins in your life and you're struggling so much with all the attacks is because you have not surrendered your life to the power and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit because when He begins to work in your life, He will empower you. He will give you the strength to do the things that God has called you to do. He will put a smile on your face. I'm not talking about you you, you, you become fake and you just put on this act that, oh, I've got the Holy Spirit in my life, I've got to act this way. No, it's something that's real. It's something that's genuine. It's like a river that flows from within. It's strength. It's power. It's anointing to live the kind of life. You've got to sit back from some time in your life. You've you got to think, man, there's got to be more to this. Man, there's got to be more to this Christian life. There's got to be more to this power of the Holy Spirit in my life than what I'm experiencing today. And I know there are some that will say, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't do those things today, that when the last apostle died, the Holy Spirit became silent, and he doesn't work in the world today. But you know, the last apostle died 2,000 years ago. John died around the year 100 A.D., but the Holy Spirit didn't die And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He is the Lord, and He does not change. And what He did before, and people say, well, He's not going to do things. But that's contrary to, to what God's Word says, because Joel prophesied, and Peter repeated on the day of Pentecost, in the last days I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Some of you turn to somebody and say, man, you need a dose of the Holy Spirit this morning. Would you do that? There's a power, and there's anointings available to every believer and the Holy Spirit came on that day of Pentecost. And we saw, you know, in, in, in Acts chapter 2, there's manifestations that are recorded. But, you know, we saw, we've seen manifestations for the presence of God all through Scripture. Wind and fire. You guys remember when, when God called Moses. I think it's in Exodus chapter 3. God called Moses. And Moses turned and he looked at a bush. And what was happening to that bush? It was on fire. And what was that fire representative of? The presence of God. It wasn't probably that unusual to see something burning in a hot desert for a, for a bush to ignite. But what caught, caught Moses' attention was that that was an extremely powerful fire and the bush was not consumed. And he perceived very quickly that this was not a natural event. This was a supernatural phenomenon. And that's the very nature and that's the very presence and that's the very power of the Holy Spirit is he is supernatural and he works in our lives in a supernatural way. He gives us supernatural ability to withstand all the attacks of the enemy because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, people. I'm going to tell you something. There are things that are happening in your life today that are direct attacks of the enemy. And if you will allow the Spirit of God begin to move and operate in your life, you'll begin to perceive that which is spiritual. We live in a fallen world and life happens and not every bad thing that happens is an attack of the enemy in your life but sometimes it is and when you have that spirit of discernment and the Holy Spirit's working in your life you will recognize that and you'll take authority over him how many of you know that the devils are subject unto us in the name of Jesus and it's through his power and through his anointing that your family can be put your marriage can be put 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 back together and your family can be restored and you can become you know your your peace and and, and your joy and your love again the joy of your salvation you can experience that once again through the power and the, and the person of the Holy Spirit. We see uh, Acts or Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 tells us this, that our God is a consuming fire. So we saw those manifestations before of wind and fire. 
representative of, of the power of God. But yet, on the day of Pentecost, we see a manifestation that, that we're not familiar with from Scripture before. And that was the speaking in other tongues or speaking in other languages. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, they began to speak in these other languages, languages that they had not learned. And those that, that, that were there for the Feast of Weeks, those Jewish people that were there for the Feast of Weeks, on the day of Pentecost, they heard these Jewish people speaking in all these different languages, glorifying God and proclaiming the goodness of God. And it really caught their attention that they, it, that they heard, they, they saw these manifestations and they saw these Jewish people that did not know these languages and yet were proclaiming these languages because the Holy Spirit is supernatural. And then we see in the church in the book of Acts how that we see supernatural events. We see a boldness in their lives. These disciples that, that for days they hid in fear. They were hiding in each other's houses. They were hiding behind locked doors. And for Jesus to find them, Jesus had to go through walls and locked doors that, because they, these guys were so fearful that they were going to be next, that they were going to suffer the same fate of the, as the Lord. But you know, when they came out of that upper room, Dude, they came out and they were not afraid of anything. They had a power in their life. They had an anointing in their life. They had a strength they had never experienced before. Even that when they were with Jesus, they had an anointing now and a confidence that they didn't have even when they were with Jesus. Because you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you another advocate, another comforter, another guide. And he's not only going to be with you, he's going to be in you. And that's that river. That's that river that flows. You know, we, we, see, we see the Holy Spirit active even in Old Testament times. Numbers chapter 11, there's, there's a few verses I want to read here. And, and Moses, uh, Moses we know, was, was such a powerful man of God. Moses was, it, it, you know, it's interesting because God said about Moses, I don't speak to him as a prophet through dreams and visions, but I speak to him as my servant face to face. So Moses is one of those incredible figures and characters in, in God's word. But yet here's an event where we see the Holy Spirit fall on 70 prophets in, in the land of Israel, those thousands of years ago. Numbers 11, verse 24, Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. And he brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord came in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and he put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. You see, there was, there was that supernatural manifestation when the Holy Spirit rested upon these, these prophets in the Old Testament. These elders, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. It was just a one-time event. Verse 26, however, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. And they were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that he would put his Spirit on them. We see, even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would, would come down upon people, these elders, and they, and they prophesied. And you notice in verse 25, as I've already pointed out, they, they prophesied that one time, but they never did it again. So in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on certain people, selective people, for only a specific purpose. And then once that purpose was done, the Holy Spirit may, may have been uh, withdrawn from them because they had done the thing that God had called them to do. We see also the Holy Spirit and active in the lives of individuals. You remember the great King David, who's a hero of mine. David, I, I, there's things I love about David, things I'm not so, 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 uh, uh, I guess so uh, uh, impressed with. Uh, the thing we know about David, now the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. David, man, David was a warrior. If you were ever going to go into battle, David was the man that you wanted to go with you. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know. I don't usually have a beef with people, but I was thinking, you know, if I had to take somebody on, would I rather have Kyle or Victoria have on my back? I think it would probably be Victoria because she would fight so much dirtier than Kyle. Kyle, because one of them's a Christian and the other's my daughter and she would shank you if she, <sighs> would not be pretty. David was one of those guys. Man. David was a warrior, man. David was undefeated in battle. David, you just said the name David, and it just it brought shivers to the, you know, I mean, to, the, to, to, his, to his enemies. 
One thing I wasn't not too happy about David, you couldn't trust him around your wife. That was another thing. But you know, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. But, but his life is so compelling, and, and he, he's such an incredible figure, and we can learn so much about him. But it's a very powerful moment when you go back in 1 Samuel 16, and you read about uh, when Samuel anoints him as king. And God had sent Samuel to the house uh, to David's family and, and to look for the king. Of course, Samuel saw David's older brothers. David was the youngest, and, and he saw all these David's older brothers, and these were guys in stature, and they were strong, and they were athletic-looking and, and impressive, impressive specimens. And, and Samuel thought, surely one of these guys, but the Holy Spirit didn't bear witness, so he finally got through all these impressive, and he said, is there anyone else? He's, <laughs> And then David's father said, well, there's one more, but I'm pretty sure you're not looking for him. He's a goat roper. I mean, he's, he's out there ten, he's out there tending sheep, man. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a guitar player. And how many of you know you just can't trust guitar players? You can't trust. Keyboard players, their hearts are close to God. Keyboard, you know, guitar players, I don't know. They're just a whole different thing. I don't know if any of them will be in heaven, but there's a chance, you know. David, David, David was a musician. He wrote a lot of the Psalms and everything. Uh, but David, David was, he was a man after God's own heart. But, but, but 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 says, And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, speaking of David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Boy, I could use some of that today. The Holy Spirit would rush. I pray the Holy Spirit will rush upon me. And give me the ability to live in a way that pleases him. You know, you, you, can, you can go to your house and, and, and uh, you can, when, when night falls and, and you can turn out the lights or you can dim the lights and your eyes can become adjusted to the darkness. And you can become comfortable sitting in the darkness. And then somebody comes in the room and they turn, they turn on the light and it's just like it's a shock. Your eyes are, I just have a feeling there are many in the body of Christ that are sitting in spiritual darkness, but they've become so accustomed to it and so comfortable with it. Jesus said, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. He's calling us to step into the light and allow the Holy Spirit because that, that, that spirit of this world that, has, that we have become so accustomed to and so comfortable with, because we have this gospel now that's being preached, pretty much you can have it all. You can have the spirit of the world and the Holy Spirit working in your life. And you can just be selective. On one day you can be close to God. On the next you're with your worldly friends. Just let it all out, baby. Just party hardy. And I want to tell you something. There's so much better. There's something so much better than that. And when we get to the place, we desire more God's Spirit to work in our life. You know, John said that the spirit of Antichrist is already working in the world today. There's a spirit of Antichrist that's in the world. But we also and have also alluded to the fact that, that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, in the last days I'll pour out of my spirit. There's a spirit of Antichrist that's working in the world today that's preparing this world for the coming of the Antichrist. But there's a spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that's attempting to prepare the church in this world for the coming of the Christ. Which spirit is working in you? Man, I want the Holy Spirit to have his way in my life. I want to experience him. I need his help. You say, well, because you're a pastor. Not just because I'm, I'm not even talking as a pastor. I'm talking about a follower of Jesus. I need his strength. I need his anointing. I need his power to over, overcome. But Jesus promised us and explained to his disciples the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. How many times you wives have had to tell your husband, If you love me, you'll just do what I say. Right, ladies? Best advice I can give you guys, just do what your wife tells you. She's a lot smarter than you. Ladies, can I get an amen? But Jesus, in all seriousness, let's get back to the Word of God because I got into some really foolishness there. If you love me, keep my commands, Jesus said. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be where? In you. The Holy Spirit will not only be with you, he will be in you. 
And so what we've seen many times, I was raised in the Pentecostal church, and but what you see many times in the Pentecostal, the charismatic part of the body of Christ, a, a very strong emphasis on the manifestations. And however God wants to manifest himself, we, we welcome that. I welcome that in my life. But it's not about manifestations. It's about the person of the Holy Spirit. And people be, can become afraid because if you've been in church, if you've ever attended a Pentecostal or charismatic church, and people, people ask, well, what kind of church is Crossroads? I don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. We're trying to be a spirit-filled church. We're trying to be a biblical church. We're followers of Jesus. We want to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. We, 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 we want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I know many of us come from different backgrounds. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, it, this was kind of an interesting dynamic. So we had four people join the church. Two of them came out of the Presbyterian church. One came out of the Catholic church. And one, her husband, had been a Lutheran pastor for 35 years. Boy, that's a mix. And then we got some holy rollers here, you know. We, we, we've got some Baptist folks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I knew, I, I knew I'd wake Ernie up. We got people from all different backgrounds because it's not about these, these, these titles and these labels that we try to put on ourselves. It's just about simply following Jesus and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and empower us and anoint us. And I would really like to see, though, is that all of us would take a little time every week and we would read the book of Acts or read out of the book of Acts and we'd ask God, do that work in me. Do that in me. Every one of us should be praying, Lord, send a revival and let it begin in me. I pray for Pete's salvation all the time, but I say, Lord, send a revival. I love you, Pete. But send a revival, but let it begin in me. Man, that's some good preaching. I wish somebody would take an offering for me right now. But, you know, people become afraid because they've seen things. They've seen some very strange, odd behavior. And then they say, the person that, that demonstrated that or, or acted that way said, what was the Holy Spirit? That made me made me do that. Uh, there was a, there was a there was a show on cable a number of years back called Snake I think Snake Salvation I think is what it was called or something like that. And it was the folks it was the folks up in the hills that were Pentecostal that were handling snakes and they were drinking poison. And somebody asked me one time if we handled snakes and I said well we tried that but I said we had too many swamp people and they thought they would try to take them home for supper you know so. We didn't, that was like a joke that they didn't think it was funny either. But, uh, but the Holy Spirit, and, but notice this, the Holy Spirit, you recall when Jesus was baptized in water, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus as a dove, right? Now I know what you, you guys are thinking. You say, well, all the miracles that Jesus did, everything Jesus did, he did because he was the Son of God. And he uh, was and is and will always be the Son of God. But Jesus did not do one miracle as the Son of God. It's important for you to understand. It's an important concept. Every miracle Jesus did, he did as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Notice that the, the Holy Spirit stressed his humanity there. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit in great power. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In other words, when you look at the life of Jesus, you say, well, he set aside for just a moment that he was the Son of God. Because Paul said in Philippians 2 that that's exactly what Jesus did. He laid aside all of his divine power, his divine authority, and he came and he was born as Mary's son. He was born at a virgin birth as a babe and a manger. And then he lived a, a sinless life. And at the age of, of around 30, Scripture tells us, he began an earthly ministry. But do you understand? Check this out. Jesus did not do one recorded miracle, not one miracle. He, he did not do one healing. He did not preach. He did not do anything until after the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Not one thing. We have no record of anything. You say, well, what did Jesus do for the first 30 years of his life? The only thing we know is he was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. And we don't have any record of Joseph, his earthly father, after the age of 12. So most Bible teachers believe that Joseph died when Jesus was young. And so being the eldest, it would have been his responsibility to step up and do the family business and take care of the family. So Jesus, Jesus was a carpenter up to the age of 30. But when his first cousin was baptizing people in the water and Jesus went down to be baptized in water, the Bible says that when he came up out of that water, the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And, and the Bible tells us at that point, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And it was that fullness of the Holy Spirit, not the fact that he was God the Son, not the fact that he was the creator of everything. 
Not the fact that he was God that became a man. It wasn't the fact he was God. It was, it was the fact that he was a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that same anointing, Paul said, if that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That same power, that same anointing is available to us today. But Jesus, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, then his ministry started. In fact, praise team will come back at this time if you would, guys. Galatians chapter 5. This, to me, I think is probably the greatest indication that the Holy Spirit is controlling your life and working in your life. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, he lists nine fruit of the Spirit. Now, Jesus and, and, and other first century teachers and writers of the New Testament would use analogies or illustrations that would help us understand. And so they use the term fruit of the Spirit. Most of us here, most of us here, are city slickers. Most of us don't grow our own food at the house. Uh, some, some of you do. Some of you probably have a garden and such, but most of us, most of us don't do that. But in that, uh, in that first century, you had to grow a lot of your own food. So there were illustrations. Many times Jesus used them about farming, about growing crops. And so it was very obvious when people say, you, you say fruit to me, I'm headed to HEB, you know, and try to buy some fruit. But but in that time, you went out to the orchard, the vineyard, you know, the olive trees, whatever, and you, you harvested it. And so it's interesting because how, how can we tell what kind of a tree we have growing in our yard? By the fruit, right? So how many of you have ever, how many of you have ever gone out and you tried to get a lemon off your apple tree? You, you, you won't find it. I mean, it, it's not there. You know it's a lemon tree because of the lemons. You know it's an orange tree because of the orange. And so, uh, and Paul, writing to Galatians, said there's going to be, when the Holy Spirit's working in your life, there's going to be fruit that's going to be evidenced in your life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and to get such things, there is no law. You see, here's the thing about manifestations. And I don't want anyone to be offended by this, but you can fake those manifestations. You see, I believe people can, I, I, I believe people can, can operate in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that that's genuine. I believe that's real. I believe that's scriptural. But people can also fake that. But you can't fake love. Not, not true love. You can't fake that. And joy, you either have it or you don't. And if you try to fake that, you really come off kind of weird. And everyone knows if you're not living with peace because you're snapping at everybody and you're angry and you're irritable and you're hard to get along with and you're no fun, you're a total buzzkill, you're the last person we'd ever invite to the party, you know? So, so, I mean, you, you can't really fake those things. These are things, these, these are evidences or fruit that grow in our lives as a result. So, so don't worry about the manifestations. You just focus on the Holy Spirit. Focus on the person of the Holy Spirit. Manifestations or His anointing or, or however He presents Himself, that, 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 that's, that's between you and Him. And, and He gives those gifts as He wills, not as we choose. These are His gifts. But it's, it's the fruit of the Spirit, His work in our life how we need to have believers, followers of Jesus that walk in love. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Wouldn't that be new? Wouldn't that be nice? Instead of attacking each other and trying to destroy each other. Don't you just love it when Christians get on Facebook and just start destroying each other? And just, just I mean, it's just, they just destroy each other on Facebook. And then the next day they're putting scriptures on there. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. It, where's, this, where's this love and this joy and this peace? Well, it's, it's a result of the Holy Spirit working in our life. How many of you need patience? You need patience? Let me give you some great advice. Start praying for patience. Because you know what happens when you start praying? Oh, God's going to give me patience. No, no, He doesn't give you patience. He teaches you patience. If you ever want to know true patience, go to Walmart. And get about $200 worth of stuff and have to stand there and wait for somebody to wait on you and check you out. You'll learn the term patience. And you might get arrested too because you'll lose your mind. with Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So I want to challenge you in closing this morning. I want, I want to challenge you to pray 
to be filled with his Holy Spirit. It's not anything you have to be afraid of. You're not going to start acting weird. No, 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 no. When, when you're filled with his spirit, you're going to experience a love like you've never had before. You're going to have a peace. You're just going to, you're just going to live in this, in this peace that everything is, 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 is operating outside of your peace and everything is operating. All, everything that's crazy in this world is happening, but yet somehow you're able just to live in peace and you're able to live in this joy and you're, and you're able to be patient with situations and patient with people and you're able to, 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 to demonstrate goodness and, and faithfulness and, and, and gentleness, self-control, all those things that Paul said, that there, there will never be a law against those things. But that, that comes when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you to stand with me today. And we're going to sing this song, Holy Spirit. And, and we're, going to pray to be, we're going to pray to be dismissed here in just a moment. But I, I want you just for a moment just to close your eyes. Father, I just pray, Lord, as we, we just take a few moments before we leave. God, we want to give your Holy Spirit, the, and we've talked about him this morning. Lord, uh, remembering the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, when there's sound from heaven as a violent wind that came, and there were flames of fire that sat upon each one. And those, those 120 spoke languages they'd never learned before, a supernatural experience. And Father, even though we are 2,000 years later, there's still such a need for us to experience your supernatural power in these dark days in which we live, when there's so much anger and there's so much frustration, there's so much division, and, and Lord, people are losing their minds, and people are struggling with, with uh, levels of anxiety, and, and people are depressed, and, and, and people are frustrated, and and yet, Father, you want us to, to experience on a supernatural level. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. This is something that you, uh, you uh, place in our lives as, as gifts and fruit of the Spirit. But yet, Father, we don't have to seek for fruit, and we don't have to seek for gifts. We seek the giver. And we're so thankful today that your Holy Spirit's available to each one. Father, I pray that you'd create in each one of us a desire and a thirst for your spirit, I ask in Jesus' name. Let's sing that chorus, Holy Spirit.